second one this month. Uh, anyone go to the first one? Yeah? Me. Is that good? I missed it. Yeah. Uh, logic apps are very powerful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They can do lots of stuff. <coughs> uh, easy to deploy. Cool. Um, we'll start off with a bit of news. Um, um, the apparently the Konami code creator Kazuhisa Han Hashimoto has passed away. <laughs> Sixty-one. Anyone remember that? That looks a bit eight-bit kind of thing. Anyone remember that? Who doesn't know Konami code? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, rest in peace. Um, all right, now some Microsoft news. Uh, apparently, Microsoft, Microsoft GitHub, I like that, is having elevated error rates. Has anyone experienced any any issues on GitHub? Surely you all must be on GitHub. I couldn't right? do a checkout this afternoon. It wouldn't be on GitHub. Was that this afternoon then? Well, yeah, it was posted one hour ago, so oh, yes. it is, you know, hot on the press news, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Microsoft ships Azure Sphere for securing IoT devices. So security from the ground up. The, uh, it meets the OWASP top 10 of uh, IoT. Uh, yeah, so like you have an IoT device and it, uh, it patches itself automatically. So you know like you've got your, your router at home that no one, you know, you install and never touch again. So the Azure Sphere is continuously updating itself in the operating system to, to guarantee security. So that's the, that's the promise of Azure Sphere anyway. Cool. And speaking of IoT, I managed to bag a really good speaker for the Leeds Digital Festival, Leeds Sharp edition, uh, in April. Uh, Jordan Appleson, uh, I don't know if you remember, he gave a talk a couple of years ago at Leeds Sharp. He's since then started his own business up uh, called Hark Systems in, in Leeds, doing uh, IoT on edge uh, techno technology stuff. Uh, so they've, they've come up with a little gateway that they install at um, supermarkets, for example, and uh, and then they have a, a dashboard in the cloud, and they they're saving these companies lots of money uh, by monitoring energy consumption and and all sorts of things. So that's going to be a really good talk. He's a he's a really good speaker as lots well. Lots of IT, lots of Azure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so bookmark that one. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Microsoft. So March, we've got yeah. uh, a 3D printed hand run using the sort of .NET Core Meadow chip. So .NET Core on a chip, you get a Xamarin application, so you can teach this hand uh, gestures and, and it's programmable. So this was in, uh, created for uh, a boy who uh, had an arm up until there, so it sort of fits onto that. So it's all about using .NET to help him uh, navigate the world, so that's a really good, interesting that's project. Amazing. Looking forward to that. Uh, he was at NDC as talk, talk speaker, so he should be really. <coughs> uh, Microsoft cancels Ignite tour at multiple locations due to coronavirus outbreak. So there you go. It's affecting everyone. Has anyone got the coronavirus? <coughs> <laughs> By the way, that's me for the news. Um, I've got one more we, item. We've we got John Ski in in June. Has anyone heard yeah. of John Ski? <laughs> Right, uh, you'll notice that you cannot RSVP for this event. This is because we suffer from a, a, um, a low conversion ratio, shall we say. Um, like 40 people came, said yes to this event, we've got 20 this evening, so we want it to be uh, as many actual people we think are going to turn up as possible. So four weeks before he's due to speak, RSVPs will open, make sure you get there. I'll send out a bulletin uh, on the day so you can uh, uh, get in, but um, if you're not able to make that event, it's going to be incredibly popular. Give up your seat if you can't make it. Cool. I want to go. Going to put a, a limit on. I mean, how yeah. much are we? Yeah, how yeah. many are they taking? Like two hundred or something. Mm -hmm. um, you, yeah, usually it's like a hundred RSVPs. So uh, how many seats are in the room? Yeah. Unless we get we're, we're giving out a price for the best uh, heckling. Uh, John Ski, so manage, if you manage to, <laughs> you manage to ask him a question that he can't answer. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Does the question have to be .NET related? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, and one last thing I wanted to mention. Um, I'm um, my company is employing at the moment. I'm employing, and I've used um, Coding Game, uh, the, the the company's side. So. If you heard of coding in, we've used it in the past. Um, good fun. 
Um, but they also, they've obviously monetized, because they've done a brilliant job and everything's free, so they've monetized that part and uh, it's really good for technical assessments. I can highly recommend it uh, if you're in you know, interview mode or employing people. So I thought I'd mention that. Um, so on to tonight's speaker, Stephen Pearce. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. Um, I'm aware that Alexa and chatbots are really important. Personally, I don't use them myself. Um, my friends would go around and say, Alexa, play me some sexy music, and it just sort of magically appears in the background. Um, so Stephen manages a big open source community uh, dedicated to um, teaching skills in .NET. So we'll be hearing about that this evening and how to program Alexa using .NET. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, I, I know one person, but I do do a quick show of hands, firstly. I promise this is the only audience participation I'm expecting until the Q&A at the end. Hands up if you own any kind of smart speaker. Keep your hands up if it's an Amazon smart speaker. Yeah, we always love a few, few that's fine. Um, hand, keep your hand up if you actually use it for anything other than setting timers or listening to music. Yeah. That's <laughs> And then has anyone actually programmed for one before? Okay, cool, that's great. It just helps me understand where I'm coming from. Um, so a little bit about me first. I, my day job is actually working for Experian, so it's credit uh, reports, it's number crunching, it's going through data, um, and that is, you know, I really love working there, but um, I get a lot more enjoyment these days out of looking through the voice community and helping with that. Um, in terms of professional experience, I have now been a programmer for so long, this is how I measure my experience. It's about one outage a decade, so I've been programming for a little over 20 years now. I've been directly responsible for two outages at the companies I've been at, um, <laughs> trying to get that down a little bit, but one was regex related and one was just, yeah, one was just me not thinking it through. Um, and then most recently, um, Amazon released the uh, Alexa skill certification. And so I'm now a certified skill builder, which essentially means I know what happens when it goes wrong. Um, Alexa itself, I'll look at the numbers here because that graph's a little small. But yeah, uh, it is starting to get some quite big numbers, but you see over the last couple of years, the numbers have slowed down. That's not anything to do with how popular it is. That's because Amazon stopped giving away free stuff when people wrote skills. So originally the numbers went really, really high, but actually it was because everyone was um, doing kind of uh, coin flippers and interesting noises coming out of the smart speaker and that was about it and then in the last couple of years it's turned into a more serious thing with people opening shops that dedicated the voice and voice analysts coming up and helping with conversational design so the numbers are still increasing um, the interesting thing as well is the number of languages it handles this is locales so this is the languages that it handles and the dialects in those languages it's in a lot more countries, but when you write, it's important to know that you don't just have to write in English. If it's not your first language, that's okay. Um, their most recent is Hindi, and the Indian market went really, really busy really quickly. Mm. Loads of people picked it up internationally because it was just a language that a lot of people wanted to help support. And then these are the speakers that you're used to. Um, I'll be honest, my sister put me onto Alexa, even though I'm the geek in the family. Met a, a family thing and she was like yeah I've got this great little speaker it tells me jokes it's all sort of stuff I thought you'd have known about it being a geek um, which I've got to admit with slightly competitive as siblings so I started having a look thousands of devices support it hundreds have got it built in now but I looked around and all the examples I could find were Python or Node which are the kind of the big two languages that they support for Alexa devices there were some Java examples you can also do other languages, but essentially there was nothing in .NET that I could see officially supported. So I started looking at the open source community and there was a small project from a guy who some of you might have read blogs for um, concerning things like XAML, which was Tim Hewer. 
He's a Microsoft advocate. And he'd ported um, some .NET code into .NET Core and just started pottering around with Alexa. He hadn't made a big deal out of it. And at that point, it was a little open source project and I just wrote some tests for it. That's all it was. I looked at it, there was a bit I didn't agree with compared to the spec. I wrote a unit test, I submitted it. And actually Tim was hugely helpful. He approved it straight away, he published a new version and that gave me the confidence to really start contributing. And just as a, a bit about the open source community and especially um, stuff on GitHub, if you're interested in a project and you see something, please don't assume that just because it's busy or just because there's a lot of functionality, you can't improve or you can't help. If there's something you spot, if there's a, even if there's a test you think that should be run that isn't there, even if it's you know functionality that's already fine right now, add it, submit it, contribute, be part of that community. The amount of times that people have caught up on stuff that I've submitted and gone, yeah, that's great, but you haven't thought of this example where it's not gonna work. And the community is a huge, huge part of what, what I've kind of built into with Alexa.net. It started off with this project and a few tests. We now have 15 NuGet packages, mostly maintained by me. The core one is still maintained by Tim. We have a dozen or so contributors and we have, I think it's tens of thousands of downloads now on NuGet. And it's been a huge adventure over the last couple of years really looking at it. I have been amazed at the amount of time and effort people will put in to help us when something has changed, they've noticed something, documentation has been updated by Amazon and we've not known about it. It's been a real journey for me. And so what I wanted to go through today was a little bit about how Alexa worked, but then also all the functionality that you get when you start buying into this and when you start writing .NET code. Because originally you do think, I'm setting a timer, I'm playing some music, and actually you can start doing some really creative things with it. The example I'm going to use, I knocked up a skill that just rolled some dice because I needed some examples. It doesn't do anything particularly taxing, and that was the point, it's just something to describe. So you roll some dice, you say roll three dice, it'll roll some dice, six-sided by default. You can say roll three 20-sided dice. The example is purely to help you give an example and so that I can kind of make this a bit more real for you. So I'm gonna go through, when we say Alexa, roll some dice, what actually happens? So there's you, you say the words, and the speech is picked up by your device. Now, a couple of things that's interesting here, Alexa is important at the beginning. It can be other words, it can be Echo, it can be computer, it can be Amazon, but it has to be one of a fixed set. The reason for this is the early versions of the Alexa device, obviously uh, you probably have seen articles about Amazon is listening all the time. Mm -hmm. And so what they had to be clear on is actually, unless you say one of the keywords at the beginning, nothing is sent to Amazon that gets picked up on the hardware and at that point it starts recording what you're saying and sending it off for analysis. The Alexa system does what I will just say as magic. There is an Amazon blog for their science on how they do natural language processing. Their team are incredible. They're also far smarter than I am. Read their blog if you're interested in that stuff but it does magic. Um, but essentially what we get out of it is a JSON request. So we get a big blob of JSON that says a lot of information, some of which we'll go into in a minute, and that gets sent to your endpoint, your code, your Alexa.net stuff. So the thing to say about the endpoint is most of the examples you see online are all lambdas. It's all Amazon Lambda. That is their default because for them, that is a security domain that they own. They can deal with access. They can worry about only the right skills actually invoking your code and it's cheap to run and it's quick to start. So it's a nice kind of learning curve for people. It is worth saying though that anything with an HTTPS connection can run an Alexa skill. If you've got a system right now that you're running that you're very happy with, make sure it's got a certificate and you can start processing these JSON requests exactly the same way. All it asks for is a little information about what kind of certificate you've got, which is just a drop down list. It doesn't ask for anything else. You give it your endpoint and it can work. We've had a few people just recently start really working on getting .NET Core um, Azure functions to work with it. Um, other than a small line of code with the way it deserializes the JSON, it's absolutely fine. And we've got some examples on the um, Alexa.net GitHub repo from issues that have been raised. So it's absolutely not a problem if you're at an Azure house, it still works. So you process the code, 
You then send JSON as response. Now I keep saying JSON, but for Alexa.net, these are all strongly typed objects. But it's worth knowing that if you use the tools, if you use the Amazon website to debug an Alexa skill, you're gonna see JSON code. But obviously Alexa.net works that for you, turns it into an object model that you can start putting in. That takes the response. And then part of the response is a voice that just says, hello. That is an Alexa skill. It doesn't matter what else you're doing, your Alexa skill is that in a big loop and you just do it a lot. So if you're having an in-depth conversation, it's just backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. And sometimes you've got state and sometimes you've got some information that you wanna use, but it's still that process over and over. And that seems like it can't do much more. We do voice, we say something else, we do voice, we say something else. But there are two points in this process that we can really start adding value. It is not easy to do good speech. And all of Amazon's documentations, design guides, and as you learn, this is still where you need to spend the majority of your time. If you don't make it a good conversational agent, no one's gonna want the extra. But the thing that makes your good conversation turn into something that might be something people will come back to is the little bits and pieces you can add to make it just a little bit more functional and a little bit more friendly for people. So there are two points where we can start adding that kind of value. And the first is with APIs. APIs is a generic term in this context, to understand what I mean here is Amazon APIs that they offer Alexa developers for an Alexa skill. And the way that works is you've got your flow, you've got the request object that comes in, that big blob of JSON, and in there, there is a lot of information. I mean, this isn't anywhere near all of it, but you've got information about the request type, that's what we use to strongly type the object. So you find out if they're just starting, if they've said a specific phrase, if there's if they're shutting down so you can get rid of any resource. If you're interacting with the device in a, some other ways with some of the extensions, that's all in there. But also, you get information about the device and you get API access. And when I say API access, that is a token that you can use to get hold of Amazon's APIs that says, I want some of informa the information that's available to me about this session. Now, there are a little bit of security there. Everything that Amazon do that isn't that core cycle is optional. What they say is voice first. So it's always, you've got to make sure that speech journey is good, but then you can add to it because the user can say, actually, you've said that you want to use this information in your skill and in the Alexa app, I've turned it on and said you can. You always have to allow for the fact that they might not give permissions and that's absolutely switched off. But if it is, <coughs> excuse me, if it is switched on, if it is available, then you can use this API token to start doing some interesting stuff. Can I, can I ask you, uh, yeah, certainly. Uh, how hard is it to get an API um, key? Uh, <coughs> from my, we're just, the reason I ask is we've, we've got a client and we're just doing some Amazon Marketplace integration and you yep. have to hoops, you have to drive through, <laughs> you know, with the GDPR and what, I do. You know, um, there's two types of key that you deal with with, um, <coughs> excuse me, with Alexa. So you've got Alexa API keys, mm -hmm. which are maintained and kept by Amazon. What you get in your skill is a short-lived token that is good for the, um, I can't remember the exact expiry, but it's during that session with that user and is only scoped to the APIs they've given you access to. And because there's that level of security on it, that just comes in every request. It's also worth noting with the recent changes that they've made to the Alexa app, there is the ability to turn on voice profiles now. So actually you get two API keys. I do need to update that slide. Um, you get a user ID, which is a token for the person whose account you are using by making the journey. So for example, we have too many, um, seven devices in my house now that are all active at any one time. <laughs> Every room except the toilet. Um, <laughs> but five of them are bound to my account, so that's that. But we have voice profiles on in the, um, in the house, so that when I speak, I get the user will always be me, but then you can get a second field, which is person. And if you have voice profiles turned on, you get that key if it recognizes that it's me. If my wife then says exactly the same thing, she'll get, my skill gets a user token that's the same, because it's still my account. <coughs> but the person token is actually for her and her details. So what you can say is actually without voice profile, we won't get it. So there's a level of security with those keys. 
You then have a second set, which is used for some of the maintenance, the um, skill management API, for example, which we'll touch on at the end, allows you to actually dive into your account and automate a lot of the processes. <coughs> that is a login with Amazon key. Now that's the kind of key you're talking about at the moment where you have all the hoops. Because that is something where you need to show a username and password field. Someone needs to log in, they need to verify with two-factor authentication, and then you have a API key and a secret, and you have to go through a standard OAuth process with that. <coughs> it is more complicated. It is hoops to jump through, and yeah, if you're trying to build that up on any kind of scale, I'd imagine that's quite a painful journey. I've only done it with some maintenance tools that I've written, and I immediately shared the code that I used to make it work with um, Windows 10 and XAML, because I didn't want anyone else to go through that pain. So yeah, it can be quite difficult. Thankfully, because of the way the Alexa skills work, we get those keys straight away. <coughs> but it's a good point. And actually, it reminded me to mention about the voice profiles as well. So thank you very much. So the first <coughs> API I want to mention is progressive response. This doesn't add value. This allows for a better journey. What this does is essentially make sure that you can send audio to your user while they're waiting. If you're doing a complex search, if you're trying to collate results, if you're trying to get some information from something which potentially you don't rely on very much, uh, is a bit laggy, your user is going to spend a few seconds waiting for the result, then thinks Alexa's messed up and just say go home, and that's it, your skill's done. <coughs> what progressive response lets you do is send a piece of text back to the Alexa speaker while it's processing. You can have up to five of these, although I'd suggest if you're having to use all five, you've got another issue and you need to optimize that journey a little bit. Um, but it's only up to five. And what it's good for is things like passive confirmation where the user feels that you're actually just reiterating what's been said, but actually what you're doing is buying time. So if it's a complicated search, certainly. I'm now searching for holidays to Spain in next month under thousand pounds and that is two or three seconds where you're processing the whole time because this is just an async thing. It's a fire and forget. You don't want to wait for that response. You want to send it and then keep processing. So your skill is still doing the work, but it's a really, really useful way. Plus, if they have made a mistake and you're spending time doing it, that's their opportunity to go, Alexa, stop. Alexa, let's try that search again because I messed up. I did something wrong. Or you misheard me because I was the other side of the room and I need to say that again. So it makes it sound like you're just being super user friendly but actually what you're doing is saying, great, those three seconds I needed, no one's noticed, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Once you have got some data, what you can actually do is add to it with some of the customer information that's available, because I've heard Amazon collect some of that stuff. Um, you've got a bit of option with what you can ask for, and this is why you have the security, because obviously some people are gonna get really uncomfortable sharing this. <coughs> but yeah, you can ask for given name or full name, mobile number and address. Mobile number and address, don't ask for feedback. They come straight out of the Amazon account. So that is your the address that you have registered against the Alexa device, and that's the phone number you have registered against the device. So um, this is why it's so important that users have to opt in for this stuff. But it does mean that if this is part of your natural journey, if you want to send them something, if you want that delivery, you can just say, is it okay if I use your Amazon address? They say yes, and you've missed out a hugely complicated part of speech. <coughs> which is to give very detailed information where normally people think about it line by line and want to be really clear about it. Um, some of these slides, I'm able to um, share the slides, but I always put the NuGet package on there. So again, this is just an extension you add. This is all strongly typed stuff. To make the API call, you just put the API key in the constructor and then there's user-friendly names for all the methods. But it's really good to be able to give that customer information even little things like, I've asked for the given name because I don't want to say hello user, I literally just want to use their first name when I respond to them. And that's a good one for voice profiles as well because then that way if my wife said something or my daughter said something, it's kind of hello Stephen, hello whoever it is that said it. So it's a nice little added feature but you've got to understand that some people aren't going to allow for that. There we go. The other one that allows you to add value is the settings API. And this is if you're trying to give information back about um, temperature, if you want to deal with time and time zones. Uh, good one for John Skeet is listening to the interesting things he has to say about the exceptions he does with no to time and the time zone problems he's got. 
some of the weird politics that have got in there. It's good for other people to do with that. So if you can just get the time zone out of the Amazon device and go, this is the time zone the user understands. Especially if you're dealing with anything that's multiple language, you don't want to assume that a language means a geography. You're able to use the stuff to go, actually, I just want their time zone right now, regardless of what it is. Um, that's opt-in again, but it's really, really useful stuff. And it picks it up from the device it's being displayed on, because that can be different, I think, now. So, and then we've got the settings for that. So there's a bunch of different APIs that let you really kind of um, mess around with the data, make sure it's user-friendly for the user it's, that you're speaking to at that time. Other APIs, once you've got the data, there's a bunch of ways you can interact with your user even though they're not directly speaking to you anymore. So reminders is the first one. Reminders are something that you create while you're doing the skill. But if you have, for example, Meetup is a really great Great one, I've done some localized meetup skills um, where it's kind of, this is the next meetup, here's all the details, would you like me to remind you? And then that will put a reminder against your Amazon devices so that your Alexa will remind you that there is a meet, uh, meetup coming up in 24 hours or two days beforehand. Excuse me. It can be absolute time or relative, so it can be that meetup at that date and time or just remind me in an hour that I've forgotten to do whatever it happens to be. They don't have to be one-offs, but obviously um, just be aware of when it is recurring that you know, how long that's going to be and what that's going to be like for the user. Good one for time zone is actually to make sure you're using the time zone API and then reminders as well <coughs> to go, actually, if I remind you of this, it is going to be three in the morning. Are you sure? Um, there are a lot of rules about reminders to get your skills certified. So the difference between you using it and not minding the seven devices go off at three in the morning, um, or that your users will mind. There are a lot of rules. You have to confirm a reminder. So you have to say, I'm going to remind you about this thing at this time every week until you tell me to stop, or every week for the next 12 months. And then they have to confirm that. There has to be always a user input to say, we're letting you do something. <coughs> it's either from the app where they've enabled the permission, and if it's through voice, then the Amazon team are really good at making sure that is a very clear interaction. The user can't ever be confused just because it's voice of what's being asked to be done. <coughs> no. So these are reminders that you have that you set up while you're using the skill. The next kind of thing you've got is proactive events. So sorry, I've got a tickle in my throat. I can't seem to hear. <coughs> so, so proactive events are events that you still have to allow the user for but they are sent proactively <coughs> when um, something changes now this is a fixed set of schemas but for example if you're shipping orders if you've got a reservation if there is a game on and the score has changed <coughs> if there is a tornado um, not so common for us but um, if there are a very specific Bin day collection, I knew there was one I was missing. Um, there are a bunch of events where you can map a particular object model and with the user's permission, you are allowed to send them even though they're not interacting with your skill. So if an order's just shipped and you want to tell your user, you can push that out. The ring on the Alexa devices go yellow and they know to say, Alexa, what are my messages? And then a, a message is read out that maps the information you've sent. The reason that they are schemas that have to map a particular model is they did originally try a notification API <coughs> where you were able to send any text anywhere. Big problem with that is you've seen the number of locales they support. And all of a sudden you had really, really good skills that were only any good in one language. What the proactive events let you do is go, well, I've got all these different notifications I want to send out and I did my conversation right, but actually these proactive events um, change based on the locale. So you can say, I'm sending a message to this locale and it, the Alexa team worry about reading that message back correctly with the data that you've specified. Uh, it also means that the messages aren't too long-winded, they're concise to the point and that adhere to all the Amazon guidelines without having to fail certificates because they didn't think about how that was going to be read out. <coughs> this is, because we haven't discussed keys enough, another key. Um, this is a uh, messaging key. Thank you, Sharma. 
this is a messaging key which is slightly different to the others because this is specifically I want to send a proactive event so I'm going to need an API key for that um, I can use that API key outside of the usual skill flow so you've got the speaker you've got the skill itself and then that's fine but then potentially your order system might be on a completely different set of machines completely different setup another domain another cloud so you get a special um, key and secret that allows you to do an OAuth journey and get a new token specifically for sending out push notifications so that you don't have to bundle in all this complicated logic about order status or reservations or game scores into the same thing as your Alexa scope. So let's look at the APIs. And at that point, you've got quite rich data, you've got a good conversation, and we've got our API kind of interaction done. The next place that you can add value is directly actually with the response that you're sending back. You can do voice, but you can also do two other sets of data. Cards are the things if you've ever opened up your Alexa app and it gives you a little history of what you've done. Those are your cards. Some of them might look a little richer than others, like if you've asked about the weather. And then directives are new parts of your object model that you can send optionally that the device itself supports and will add value at a device level. So your cards are rich like that. There's very few options with this. They're quite templated and that's on purpose. But then with the directives, you can get some really interesting interaction. One of the biggest things that happened to the Amazon devices recently is they added APL, the Alexa presentation language. <clears throat> and basically this is to allow for the fact that Alexa got screens all of a sudden. But not just screens, it's eight and 10 inch and five inch and your phone and now the nice 80 inch LGs with Alexa built in and these big, big displays that are still running at Alexa um, through a remote control picking up your voice. So all of a sudden you've got this big canvas and that's what you see on that canvas. It's not great as experience goes and it is still voice first. That's still what they're worried about from the Amazon team because these are speech devices. But when I'm going, look, at, we've got Alexa on the TV and I asked it to roll the dice and that's what I got. The wife doesn't understand why I needed the bigger telly quite so much. <laughs> What APL lets you do is take that default screen and turn it to something a little bit richer, like that. I'm still only rolling dice. This is a simple example. I got into voice because I can't make things pretty. Giving me a different interface to do that doesn't make it any easier for me. <coughs> but I can make it a little bit more. And it's really good for information that is available at a glance because a lot of the time we're using these devices, we're not next to the thing. We're across the room, we're in the kitchen making something, we're sitting down and going, oh, yeah, I like to do that thing. And you want that feedback. Yeah, you want the voice, but if there's two or three bits of data, you want them on the screen as well. That, behind the scenes, is that. And um, yeah, there's still a bit off the end. That is a lot. <laughs> Doesn't get any prettier. Um, this is actually a APL editor, which allows you to um, click and drag bits of the UI and start building up the APL in real time on the screen. You can then save that JSON and load it into your code and then send it back as part of a, a render document directive. Alexa.net has an APL extension that will take that, turn it into an object model for you and make it much more convenient for you to start working this stuff. Don't look at the code so much with the APL <laughs> NuGet package. Um, I've had to do some interesting bits and pieces with JSON.NET to make it work because this is a very flexible model. Flexible as in sometimes the words don't have to be right. The item property is the same as the items property because it's JavaScript and who cares? Um, .NET developers care and it really, really, really got took quite a long time with people raising issues and going, I've just copied this from the browser and Amazon tell me it's good and your NuGet package tell me, tells me it doesn't and it's because there was yet another exception I'd missed. So it did take a long time, but actually when you start getting into the .NET code, it's pretty convenient. 
and we do allow um, what's called a JSON directive, which is literally just take the stuff that we've just loaded as a JSON document and just dump it out raw. Don't try and serialize it, don't try and make it pretty. I've done all the hard work, just send it. Which is actually really convenient if you've dumped that into an S3 file or an Azure blob and you just want that data sent out. You've got a bunch of basic controls. So text, button, image, video. Um, video's got some rules about it, but it's actually really good at uh, streaming that stuff. And you saw with that one before, I'd used image as a background, but then I've added some blur and this kind of thing. So there are some basic options. Um, so I've got two text controls there, image with the blur in. You can mess around with the layout as well. So just to make sure that things are centered and that kind of stuff. So you have a container, which is your kind of main document that you're trying to put things into. Pager is essentially, you can create multiple screens and then you can swipe left and right and have pages of data. So the weather is a good one for that. It gives you today's information, then it gives you kind of the next week, and then it gives you a little bit more detail. And you can swipe backwards and forwards. And then a sequence is literally just, I want this information in a list. So if I've got a pager and that's page one, I swipe and then, yeah, I went back to my usual design interface, um, but that's page two. And that's using a sequencer of just numbers one to nine and then put through. So it literally just lets you go, I've got nine things, show them, this is my template for each one, lets you template some stuff out. You can do data binding in the APL NuGet package. Um, we strongly type everything. And if you just try and pass it in as a string, we handle that and go, well, it's not supposed to be a string, so you must be data binding. So all of this is supported in the .NET code. Um, we've got a couple of helper methods for it. But essentially, you can pass in a payload, which is a JSON document separate to your design. So you can say, this is my page. So for example, with that one, that is my page. But then I pass in a payload, which is the total and each of the numbers that got represented in the role. So I rolled three dice at this point, and I can just push that in. So that and the data binding allows you to create something really rich, and then you're not having to constantly rebuild the whole document because you saw how big they were. Data binding's great, but it does show one little problem, which is that is what it looks like on my big screen. I've got the little echo spot, which is like a, a five inch screen, and it's circular, and it looks like that. And that is not an easy thing to handle because I don't know exactly what I'm gonna be displaying on, but I want it to look good all the time. And I've got this horrible white space at the side, and it's crammed off to the left, it's a bit cramped. You can, in data binding, do some really interesting stuff <coughs> with um, the viewport shape. So you, um, if you see some of the documents, and they are incredibly big documents, where people have gone to the depth of, if it's a rectangle and it's less than a thousand pixels in visible width, then render it this way, otherwise this way, otherwise this way. And you have a when property, which is literally uh, conditional. So in some cases, people are sending JSON documents down that are three or four whole forms, and it just decides which one to render. It's like CSS media queries on, but gone a little bit nuts. Yeah. Why haven't they used HTML? It's like some language you already know. <laughs> Originally, it was because they wanted to control the aesthetic, and they wanted it to be pushed out because they own the devices as well. Um, I get the impression talking to some of the team last year that it was a, we, did, we knew we wanted to do graphics, but the easiest way was to control everything right now. Because that way it could just be pushed in as part of the JSON, rather than people having to worry about JSON and HTML and encoding and, and. It also meant that they could create a consistent feel. Skills will always look like this. They may not always look pretty, but they will always look the way they're supposed to when those controls are used. So it's a consistent user experience. What they did come up with was, rather than doing this a lot, last year they created this set of responsive controls. So these are controls that do all the work for you. Behind the scenes, they're still doing, they're still changing based on the visible width. They're still changing based on the size. But they worry about the fact that you're on a big TV and it scales up the text for you. So what you're saying is this takes up 20% of the screen and it's fine. And what that means is that this is now page one but my page two looks a little prettier now. I've got list items. I've got an ordinal control, which automatically does the numbering. 
and it's just a better visual experience. To that point though, they have started with a, I'm gonna get the name wrong, it's, I think it's WebGL game API. There is a new API that they've um, started to um, do a closed beta on, which is HTML, CSS, much more improved uh, in a way of working with that stuff. In fact, if you look at the Alexa devs, I think somebody plugged in a keyboard into an Alexa device and played Doom to death, which was an interesting way of working. Um, out of the box, they have got an animation framework, so if you want to do simple stuff, I've seen some really interesting RPG adventures where you know the sword is swiping because you can mess around with an image and it's X value and it's Y value now. It'll allow you to do animations, and they're a little complicated, but there are some great uh, communities out there that have gone, yep, this is the animation to do a roll to do a, a kind of explosion and this kind of thing and they've built them all in so you just need to copy them into your document but hopefully when the um the web api becomes more general stream we'll be able to start seeing some really rich stuff but i would imagine that's um got still got some work to do i did try and get on the closed beta by asking the team but they haven't been able to get there yet so but yeah so it still allows quite a lot and genuinely apl is a, a whole talk in itself and if you look at like the reInvent videos, it's several talks by itself. They've spent a lot of time trying to make this good for all devices and relatively straightforward for all developers. <coughs> the other thing is, it's speech first, so is the APL. If you can touch the screen and swipe, then when you say something, <coughs> that gets sent back and then you can send a directive, which is execute a command on the screen. So it might be go to page two, it might be scroll down, it might be run this animation, it might be update the data, set a value. Um, with a couple of commands worked in together, you can do what's called a karaoke mode. So you can set a few variables, so all the, you can send it speech and a command to um, look at a piece of text and actually it will highlight the text as Alexa is reading it back, it lines the two up. And that's a really good experience if um, you've got a lot of text or people want to read along. And that's how it does something like uh, lyric playback when you listen to music. You can still do user events as well, so people can still tap the screen, you can have buttons. Um, they did a competition last year and it was Loop It, I think was the name of the skill that won. And it was essentially, you could pick the drums you could pick the melody, you could pick the sound effects and it would mix it all together and return an MP3 of your creation. And you could do it through voice or you could do it with the buttons. There's some really interesting skills out there if you look for um, APL example skills. Some of the ones where people have really gone to town on the UI, it's incredibly good. And that's just a list of the commands you can do. Run things in order, scroll. Um, auto pages, after a period of time, go to the next one. So it just kind of shows a summary. And then the, um, there's a gap here because set value and animate item. They've recently updated execute commands so you can now do the animation. You can also create custom commands so you can bundle some of this together, send it in your original document. And then when you hear a piece of speech, just do execute command show role detail. And that's already bedded into the document. On mount also lets you do um, commands on startup. So when an element is displayed, it runs the on mount. Anyone who's done uh, React development will be used to that. And it basically does things like that. That's a gift from my browser. I promise you the animation is smoother on a device. Mm -hmm. It's also smoother when it's not a gif. Um, but yeah, so you can do animation like that and roll that kind of stuff in. This slide is gonna feel wedged in and that's because I feel Microsoft wedged it in as well. Um, you might see this stuff, Amazon even. You might see these devices with the clocks. It's worth saying that out of the blue, didn't see it at all. They did this, which is APLT, which is a design language for a little text display that does a clock. It will scroll text. There are letters you can't render. Um, <laughs> has a problem with X. Um, but yeah, there's three or four letters you can't render and it's really interesting trying to make sure that every bit of text you send isn't going to have one of those letters in it. Um, but as people develop for that, they can specify the size of the screen, you can make adjustments accordingly. 
and you can send that out and it's just a nice little bit APLT yeah that took a while but that is in the latest version of the alexa.net.apl uh, NuGet package so if you do get one of those or you know someone that has you can start sending them little messages across the screen <coughs> money um, obviously a big part of any ecosystem is the ability to sell and uh, the Alexa device is no exception. You can create products. You can create them through the automation APIs or through the web browser, and then you can try and sell them. Um, there are three types of products you can generate for Alexa. An entitlement is something that you will then have forever once you've bought it. I would <coughs> like this background in all my APL stuff. Not a problem, you now have the you know, Fire Inferno background, that's it, you've got it. Um, they test that your skill will honor that and the API work allows you to double check in case somebody's canceled or taken it back. But basically the idea of an entitlement is you pay once, you have forever. You can do a subscription, which is you pay monthly. I think it's always monthly, but I want to check. Um, and you then keep getting it and every time they use your skill, you ping off to the products API and go, have they still got an active subscription for this? And it goes, yes. And you go, great. And you let them have that functionality. And a consumable. I would like to have hints in something. I would like to have lives in a game. I would like to have a tip on how to solve this puzzle. They are consumables. You buy a certain number of them via the consumable and then they run out and they go to zero and then you buy them again. And it's all in the package, but Amazon deal with all the money. And this is why I keep saying you ping the products API, because you get a connection request come through. So I mentioned right at the beginning, you get launch requests, you get end of session requests. And one of the requests you can get is a connection request. And that says this person has just bought something or they canceled it during the purchase process or it was an upsell. So they've gone from one to another and therefore you can look at the details and adjust your information accordingly but everything is done from amazon and when i mean everything i mean everything that's what you get on screen on one of the shows or spots it tells you the amount all the t's and c's you aren't aware of any of the credit card information actually your session terminates so you send a um a directive down saying i want to purchase the user then ends your session, as far as the Alexa device is concerned, and starts Amazon's payment process. You are not allowed to mention how much something costs in your skill. <coughs> the reason for that is that they do a 70-30 split, as uh, a lot of others do. You get the 70, Amazon get the 30, and Amazon are very, very comfortable messing around with their 30%. If you are a Prime member, for example, on Prime Day, skill purchases go down for you. It's not just products. And that's because they will take a percentage of their 30% and actually give a discount to the user. So even though you've said, I want to sell it at 99p, that doesn't mean that's the price the user saw. You will always get what you are due based on that price, but Amazon might take less to get a better deal and get a better conversion rate on it. So you actually will fail certification if you put the price in. But that's all handled for you. They put it through, the credit card details, the subscription information is absolutely fine. And your skill has to be able to handle Amazon cancel my subscription. Amazon <laughs> stop doing it, I don't want it anymore. I changed my mind. Um, at that point you get a response back and you get bought, already owned. Potentially you've sent a buy product and someone on another device on the same account has already bought it, but you didn't know about it in your session. Therefore, you do can get already owned quite easily. And then literally you just deal with it that way. Amazon's testing is very thorough for skills. They will go through all the different scenarios and they never take any money if the account that's being purchased on is the developer's account. So you can test all your journeys yourself with your account and nothing ever gets touched. They don't tr uh, process any of the transactions when you are the developer and the person buying. Yeah. Is that how you test skills, skills then? When you develop them, you have to <coughs> release them to Amazon and they buy them yourself? 
Uh, for the product stuff, yeah, you use the assigned account. So if you're for a company, you'd have to be on a device that was tagged to the company that was working on the account, yeah. Most of the skill work that you do is, because of the object model we use, is um, good for unit testing. But yeah, this is one of those journeys where you can test the to and fro, but really you do want to do some debug testing. When you load your skill, into the skill developer uh, website and you start going through the options there is a test button so you don't need a device to do it you can do it through the browser and you can literally just say i want to test go through the test environment or the live environment and you can check it out because it never processes a transaction it also means if someone says there's a problem with your live environment you can go into your test area go to live still go through the same journey knowing that you're not going to have to worry about refunding yourself or asking for anything like that yeah do you need to um, do you need a, a seller account like a, a marketplace? You need to have set up the tax forms and have a payment. So yeah, you go through some of it, but it's not as in depth as a full Amazon seller. Right. So, but yeah, you still need to go through enough that they can uh, send that back. Um, and while I'm talking about money as well, it's also worth mentioning that that's also used once you've set that up. If you have a popular skill, and I say popular when you have something that is used a bit. Amazon will also use the payment information you set up to give you money if your skill is popular enough. I think I get a whole $20 a month because one of my skills is big over in the US. Um, but I, I know that people get varying amounts and that mine is really not very popular at all. But yeah, they will use it to send you cash if you do something that enough people are engaging with. And it's essentially so that you keep those skills up to date, you might add functionality to them, and so they're getting a better um, conversion on other things through Amazon by paying you a little bit and making you interested. You've got to tell us what the, what the honestly, it's, it's embarrassing. All it was Trump insults is no, no, we we can't make a decision about what takeaway to have. So I developed a skill that called which one, and it literally is which one shall I do that one or that one? <laughs> oh, it's just a random. Type. And it just yeah, it just picks it random. I am still umming and ahhing about the ability to buy loaded results. So behind the scenes you go, the next time I ask for this, make sure the answer is, and then pay me as a consumable. Because <laughs> I feel there's some money to be made there. But yeah, um, partly just to see the wife always lose the argument. It's, it's random, I swear. It's, it's not okay. But yeah, and that gets me $20, $30 a month. But it is interesting, so do some stats on the kind of stuff that people say with the analytics. You can't get the exact speech, but if you have variables that you're using, like that one, I, I can see what the variables are. And yeah, people ask to, to some weird stuff. Kind of <laughs> sharks or pirates, that I got. Pirates and ninjas, not so much. And then, yeah, you get some odd results coming through when you start looking at what people are comparing for. But yeah, um, so it's always worth setting up a little bit of payment information if it's off your solo account, just in case I'm gonna decide to give you some money. It's always a good one. So is it kind of like a I mean, presumably they don't get a payment stream when they say when you go into which one. There's some micropayment happening behind the scenes, or is it Amazon just paying you because you did something useful for them? It's literally yeah. Um, that screen is only if I'm specifically trying to sell and get them to buy. Right. Amazon pay the developers if it's popular enough. So based on usage purely. Okay. So. <coughs> um, but yeah. Uh, and then if you're saying, you always have, again, it's always about making sure there's user input. After they've had the interaction, you could go, um, you seem to have tried a few times and failed. Would you like to buy a hint? And the user has to say yes to start the purchase process. Otherwise you can't certify. It is bedded into every one of their rules about certification that the user has to have. You can ask, but the user has to have agreed and you shouldn't be seen as a gateway. You shouldn't be going, Oh, you're about to answer this question. Are you sure you don't want to buy a hint first before you... It's got to be the skill first and then the payment is a natural kind of... Not afterthought, but it's a natural part of the conversation afterwards. You can't block the user from having the functionality. Gadgets. Now this is from... I'm talking to someone earlier about gadgets. This used to be a really small part of my talk. It was great. I went, there's buttons in case there's games. And then I moved on. Um, but yeah, there are buttons. You can still buy them. Um, they are literally little LEDs with a plastic button on top that can get smashed very hard. Did mention the family was competitive. Um, essentially what you do 
is you have buttons around and you send the directive as part of your responses like hi welcome to the game please let me know what devices you want to use and that is essentially a roll call and in alexa.gadgets we have a help method which is just add roll call because it's such a common process you press the button they are bluetooth enabled they connect to your device they're paired up beforehand you get a bunch of device ids back and because that one was tapped first you call it device one and the next one and then you can say okay if the user presses a button five times while it's red, then I want to know about it. And I want to call that pattern, pattern X. I want to call it, um, you know, did the right thing. The Alexa device and the gadgets worry about the communication, worry about all the monitoring for you. And you just get an event back going, yep, that thing that you asked for, five times on red, they did it. Or it timed out and you get a response back. So you don't have to interact with the device specifically you can say I want to do that or if the user taps when uh, within five seconds and it's on purple then um, send me failure and you can set up a bunch of different ones and you just get events and it is basically used for games if you've got a game and you know someone is the red player and someone is the yellow player and they've got to press the button when it's their color that kind of thing or just listen to all the devices I've been roll called and whoever taps first first one in gets to answer the question that kind of thing that was it, that was my talk. I was very happy with that, it was simple. And then six months ago, they ruined it. Um, all the gadgets, so they've now got a custom interface kit. Essentially, anything with the Bluetooth connection can be an Alexa gadget, can become something that Alexa can communicate with. It'll pair up over Bluetooth, and you can then, a um, bit of the technical detail, it uses protocol buffers, to send messages over Bluetooth between the device and the Alexa. There is a big spec. Um, I'm not a Bluetooth engineer, but thankfully Amazon did release a Raspberry Pi library that allowed me to just go, my Raspberry Pi is a Bluetooth device. I'll run the thing they told me to run and it works. What it means though is that anything that can, can, you can communicate with with your Raspberry Pi can then also be an Alexa enabled device by using the Raspberry Pi as a go-between. So yeah, now roll call isn't just which button am I pressing. Roll call is anything you're paired with. The device has to send a specific ID when it gets paired to say, I'm an Alexa gadget. And then you can send that device to do stuff. So you could have a dice roller that tipped and roll the dice for you. <coughs> you can have robots. Lego Mindstorm have done um, a big robot kit. And it is with a little bit of Python code put onto your Raspberry Pi an Alexa enabled robot that will twist and turn and move. They've done Billy the Wide Mouth Bass, they've done Singing Santa, they've done a lot of different demos for this stuff. It is a lot of fun and it is just a similar process. You can either say, do the stuff, or you can say, I wanna know about it, send me when this happens and it will send you a message back. I make it sound very straightforward because I'm a .NET developer, not a Bluetooth developer. Um, there is technical detail involved. I am still playing with a .NET Core library that will work with the Bluetooth stuff on the Raspberry Pi, basing it on their version, but the Bluetooth libraries for Raspberry Pi and .NET Core aren't great at the moment, and a lot of Amazon's stuff relies on knowing the actual binary that's being sent and going, this is the code I want to send exactly. So it's taking a little bit of translation. So yeah, all donations gratefully received if there's anyone out here who likes Bluetooth. Um, but yeah, but it basically means that you can do an awful lot with gadgets now. And again, YouTube it and do Alexa gadgets and you'll see a lot of the examples they do. Um, a couple of others. Personalization, I know we already talked about personalization at the skill. You can do personalization in the response as well. Um, dynamic entities which is basically a nice way of saying, I know that this person has got a skill. I've written all this wonderful stuff about all the different ways that people can have the conversation. I've thought of all the different phrases they're gonna use. And this person has decided that when they roll three dice because they're playing D&D, &D, they wanna say roll fireball. Well, I didn't expect fireball because I'm a dice roller and I expected dice numbers. What you can do is as part of your response, you can say, well, I know this person has got these new options, and actually you can change what the Alexa device is listening to 
to make the um, speech that the user can say personalized to them. Um, and actually that's gonna be quite a good one for things like uh, purchasing. If you wanna go, actually, yeah, 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 you can have your, your own custom things for dice rolling because you've got a game, but pay me a subscription for that. Um, and then, yeah, you send it down, you send it at the beginning of the session, and you say, yep, yeah, when they say 3D6, actually there's a bunch of other options they can say now as well. And here they are. And then that session will have those new options. And it's just a nice little way of being able to get that in. There we go. Um, there is another one. I thought it was on the next slide, and I think I have accidentally removed it when I was tidying up. Um, they've added one when you send speech down. You can do SSML, speech synthesis markup language. I always have trouble saying that. Um, which allows you to change the pitch, change the tone. You can whisper. You can say that words that potentially are being rendered are expletives, and therefore it will just bleep them out. You can do a bunch of different stuff. They've just added a new tag that says person's name. And unlike personalizing it in the text in the skill, this doesn't require permission because you're not getting that information. You're putting a tag into the SSML that says, at this point, just say whatever the user's name is. I don't need to know what it is. I just want it to sound nice. Um, and you can send that down. It's an XML format. The um, core Alexa.net library has full SSML object models to be able to render it all so you don't have to worry about the XML and that's in there as well. So it's just another way of being able to personalize the response you get back. Um, also, if you don't like the Alexa voice, that's the other way of being able to do it. Yeah. Is it similar to using Polly? It is very similar. They've taken a subset of the Polly voices and given them by default, because I think behind the scenes it's still the same essential technology. So a lot of the voices are Polly names as well. But yeah, it's a very, very similar thing. There are now, See, there were eight originally, and now I know there's more, and I can't remember how many. There are a number of different voices. And all you do is you wrap the text in an SSML voice tag and just put the name in that you want. They have got locale-specific voices as well. So there's a nice page in their documentation that simply says, if you are speaking in this locale, this voice is a natural fit because that tone and inflection works best with that language. So you can then start doing some really interesting stuff where the voice is just better for what you're trying to speak dependent on the locale you're trying to support. But yeah, it is very similar to Poly. It's a subset though. It doesn't go to the ex extent and you don't currently get the newsreader option you'd get with some of the Poly stuff as well, where it feels uh, just a little bit more natural because you've got that news presenter style. That's not available right now, but it is very extensive and you can do some really good stuff to get that emotive feedback, <coughs> which is really, really nice. Um, but yeah, the customer name is just one of the personalization options they've added, but there's a whole bunch to SSML as well. A lot of fun in there, and they do keep adding to it randomly. It's one of those pieces of documentation where I just keep having to nip back and go, I think we support all this. But I follow a lot of people on Twitter so that I don't have to, because they just go back and go, I just found this tag. I'm like, brilliant, that's it. We had some support for that. But yeah, yeah, if you've done Polly, it'll feel very natural. It'll feel very similar, it's quite good. So that's the directives, and that's the API. And at this point, I normally check them all out. Fantastic. Um, because there is the bit that I call leftovers. I talk about the API, I talk about the directives, and they are hugely important, and they do add value. But there's just a couple of bits and pieces that sit around the outskirts that we support as part of Alexa.net that really, I feel, help out a little bit. The first is Alexa.net.management. This is the skill management API. Nothing to do with the skill itself. This is managing. This is listing all the skills that you've got. This is publishing new versions of it. This is altering the, the um, intents that you're listening for. You can use data catalogs if you have a large number of things that you want to listen to. For example, you've got a whole store's worth of products. <coughs> you can upload a data catalog and say, this option is gonna be something in this list and it'll build a custom model for you. That's all handled through the uh, skill management API. Publishing, certificates, beta tests. <coughs> um, trying to think, there's some others. Oh, uh, in, intent testing. So I've just added this to my catalog. Would it understand this sentence? Get some feedback in real time by passing text in rather than actually having to speak. So you can automate the tests over actually making sure this phrase should always return this thing. 
and no matter how much we mess around with it, the test says this phrase will always return this thing. <coughs> Skill management API lets you test that and actually get feedback. So you can really start doing some really good stuff for CI, CD with Alexa skills. <coughs> I've built a little thing, I'm pretty sure this is public now. This is just an example of what I use with it. So this is how I do my Alexa skills now. I don't use the website so much, this is a Windows 10 app. My little vendor ID down the bottom, I've got it me. These are some of the skills I've done. That's an old list, it's a lot bigger now. But then the model, the, um, the beta is quite a good one to automate if you've got a list of people who normally want to test your skills. To be able to run two or three API calls and go, yeah, it's a new version, we created a new beta, we sent it out to those people, it's all done, it's fine. Have that as a button is really helpful. Um, so yeah, the skill management API is a really good one. And if you like your automation, that's where you'll spend a lot of your time. It's certainly where I spend a lot of my time, but I'm a tool writer, so that's kind of what I do. Alexa.net.requesthandlers. If you look for any Alexa skill stuff from Amazon, they use a format called a request handler. And basically the problem is <coughs> that what you get when you start building your skill is fine. If you're gonna launch the skill, run this bit of code. Then if it's the end of the session, run this bit to clean up. Then if it's this intent, do this. And now if it's purchasing, now, if it's purchasing and it's payment and they bought it, I want this. But if it's a purchase of payment and they cancelled, I want a different response. And it starts getting kind of messy kind of quickly. And so what Request Handlers tries to do is boil down your interaction to try and create encapsulated bits of logic you want Alexa.net to handle. And it boils it down by creating an interface. This is the only code in my slice deck. This, these two methods. The first one is I've got some skill information which is an object that um, we help you spin up with one line of code. And it's basically the information that you've got, any state that you might have passed in, um, and says, can I handle this? Based on the information that's passed in. So is this a launch request? Is this for a purchase and the decision was buy? So it lets you just do it. And then a handle method that goes, yep, you were the first thing in the list that can handle this request. Your logic is the bit that's gonna be processed. And then what you do is you register as many request handlers in you want in, as you want in priority order into a skill pipeline and your function is just skill pipeline dot process and then my request what that allows you to do is take your encapsulated logic use that interface put it into a completely different assembly somewhere else so your actual piece of work that has to deal with azure functions aws lambda all your security any custom stuff you've got never has to change you can update the logic completely separately in another assembly and just use this interface of a skill pipeline. To give an example, this is what I came up with when I first tried to turn my code for the role caster into request handlers. So I've got the usual stuff, launch and roll and roll again, and then breakdown and then roll history. Then I try to look for purchasing, so it's, I wanna buy a product. Now you can just say, what can I buy? and Amazon will tell you what products are available. So actually I've got, well they asked for to buy a specific product because that's easier for me to handle, so that goes at the top of the list, but also buy any product just in case they just say, what can I buy? Because I need to support that for certification. Then it's the purchase, then it's the client, then God forbid something goes wrong, I need to know about it. Then there's the ones that you have to do at the end. If a user says help, you have to support that. Don't have to support it very well. You can just restate what the purpose of your skill is and hope they get it. But that normally allows a more uh, context-driven help or a little bit more detailed help. Fallback is an interesting one. Um, there is a fallback intent, which is essentially the user said something and they definitely said it at your skill and we have no idea what it is. You get anonymized stats on the fallback intent after I think it's more than 10 unique users have used the skill more than, I'm gonna get the number wrong, but it's something like more than 50 times. So basically it's enough that they can anonymize it without you trying to figure out who said what. But you start getting information back and that's hugely useful because if you're trying to create a skill that people want, but they're all saying this thing you don't support, you wanna look in that every now and again and go, well, what did they say and why am I not supporting it? How are they thinking my skill needs to be used that I'm not supporting? So fallback's a really good one. But all of this is maintained in a completely separate library to the actual role caster function, <coughs> which is just create the pipeline, run the pipeline, done. That never changes. So I've added everything after the first two or three 
and I've never touched my AWS Lambda function at all. I just keep updating its reference and its um, project reference. So request handlers, not directly related to the skill work, but a really, really useful one to just make it easier to maintain. Uh, and it's in priority order, that can handle method. So things like the by specific, by any, have to be in that order. Otherwise, it'll, by any will also trigger. And therefore, you just got to make sure the ordering is right. And that is pretty much all of the assemblies that I handle and Alexa.net ecosystem overview. A few resources. The Alexa blogs are fantastic. Some of them go way above my head when they start doing the science, but there's some really interesting stuff in there, even if you don't understand it. I really liked in the last six months, um, actually they talked about how they watermark the audio in their ads so that the Alexa devices know it's an advert and they don't respond to it. That's, don't understand a lot of the sciencey stuff, but the fact that that's what they went to because ads were triggering devices is a really interesting idea of how they're trying to improve that space. Design guide, relatively new, loads of documentation in there. When it says design, that is not just the APL stuff, that is conversational design. What makes a good conversation? How should you be speaking to your user? Worrying about tone, worrying about how your brand is represented by that tone. Really, really useful stuff, which a lot of traditional designers will struggle with because it is a learning curve to get right. Plus, we're developers, we're the worst. <laughs> One thing we want to do is make sure everything is in the message that we send because there's data and the user needs it and it's horrible when a developer's done an Alexa skill for the first time because it's three paragraphs of text and they're waiting going, I, I just want to say no and I, I really don't care anymore but I, I need to finish. Getting it right, so sometimes you imply with tone, sometimes you don't need to give them all the information, they can ask for it. You try and keep it down to the one breath rule. If you can say it in a breath, it's probably okay for an Alexa device. If it's more than that, they should ask for it. Or you need to think of a better way of saying it because the user has a really short attention span. They're shouting at three kids and trying to talk to the Alexa speaker and, and, and. Some of the natural language work they do where they're trying to make it easier to understand who's speaking. <coughs> I um, went to a meetup where someone did audio testing and I'd never quite appreciated how much they have to listen to when you have an entire family around the table and someone tries to trigger a skill because they just don't know and the, the Amazon team have to try and figure that out based on context and speech processing. So getting it right so that you give the right information really quickly so that person is still focusing on the speaker and not on the three screaming kids is really worth it. So the design guide's great. And the Alexa Devs Twitter account. Get on the tweet, look at it. They've got a list of all the Alexa champions which are recent people who have been named as really important in the Alexa voice space. Um, you'll also see that following that is all the architects and the team from the Alexa side of things. They're a great bunch of people, really responsive if you feed back. One for me, if you don't already follow him, Norm Johansson, um, and I'll try and um, post out his thing. He's the team lead for the .NET in AWS. So actually I've been working with him an awful lot as he's been trying to look at how .NET Core can interact how's best to try and get the .NET space more uh, present with things like the Alexa stuff. He's been a great help. So yeah, definitely recommend that. For a starter, um, it's on the slides. It's my domain. Um, I'm trying to move it over to a .dev at the moment, but it's still I'm a code.ninja due to a t-shirt I had when I started the website. On I'm a code.ninja, there are now two screencasts, one for Azure Functions and one for AWS Lambda, which is your starter for 10 for spinning up an Alexa skill. So I literally go through with Visual Studio and the AWS extension and get it right through to testing it in the um, Alexa test environment from start to finish using Alexa.net. So we had a lot of people going, this is great, it's a great ecosystem, there's a lot of documentation. How do I start? Hmm. And actually, when I started putting it together, there are several bits and pieces that, are, if you don't know the world, might trip you up. And they're not difficult to get around, but it was just a bit annoying. So they're little like 10, 12 minute screencasts that just walk you through the steps. And that's me. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, Stephen. That was great. A couple of questions. Have you got time for questions? Yeah, absolutely. Got loads of time. Um, on service discovery. So let's say I write my skill. Um, Big up the lead sharp sponsors, I've got yep. Azure function, it goes yay fruition, yay Bruntwood. Yep. How does Alexa know where my endpoint is? Um, 
by default, all the skills go into the store and traditionally they rely on you picking up your skill through the Alexa store. So the, um, there are keywords, there are search phrases, it's kind of standard SEO stuff. That said, although that is the only way of getting people to buy into a new skill for now, what is in beta testing, and it's been in beta testing for a little while while they work out the kinks, but it's a new type of request your skill can um, use. Um, we've got support for it in Alexa.net. It's in the core package. No, we have to take it out of core because it was still in beta. So we do have a package for it. We have a can fulfill request a package. It's in the extension list on the main GitHub repo, um, which is a can fulfill request. And basically what that does is if your interface supports it, what Amazon are starting to do is take a request that they can't handle and ping the details of the request to a skill and asking the skill if they could support that request if they redirect the user to it. And then actually feed back and go, we don't know about this, but we think there's a skill over here you might like that does the job. Do you want to try that? It will auto install when you confirm and start running a new session with that information straight away. And then, um, and yeah, Amazon have had that in beta since last year now. Um, but yeah, fully supported and we're starting to see it in devices in the UK. I don't know if they're starting to test custom skills, but certainly um, some of the kind of uh, first party stuff that Amazon have been doing have been really, really good with that. Yeah. So yeah, they are starting to improve it. And second question on that. If I go Alexa, what is my credit score? <laughs> How does it know to go to Experian rather than TransUnion uh, or vice versa? Or do they, do they get split between the two? If you have... I did test this at some point. I'm trying to remember what the reaction was. Because yeah, the um, issue is that yeah, if you have two skills that have the exact same phrase, the um, the way they get around it at the moment is you have to specify the name of the skill. So it is ask, I try not to say ask experience because we don't have our Alexa skill in the UK. But um, yeah, ask Experian, what is my credit score? If you say Alexa, what is my credit score? You'll probably get a Wikipedia entry about credit scores. Um, and that's the thing is you have to ask that the skill so and with can fulfill requests that's where that's trying to come in is you're still going yeah I want to install that skill and then every subsequent one you'll still need to be saying open experience or open credit card or open whoever it happens to be so yeah they're trying to help on that initial request but yeah if you know who you want to deal with you have to say open skill name and then um, it's also worth mentioning the skill name doesn't have to be same as the brand name so for example, we might be um, Experian because it's a short word for the Alexa skill, but then we would brand as Credit Expert, which is our main product, or Credit Matter, our other product. So we might use that for our branding, but then use a different name because it's shorter and more succinct in the Alexa skill. So your invocation phrase doesn't have to be the name of the skill. It's whatever feels natural. But obviously, if you are going to distinguish between the two, you've got to be really sure your users are going to know that distinction because you're moving away from what you sold. So um, as part of certification, you must give three example phrases. The first one has to start with opens whatever your invocation name is. So when somebody installs, they will see what you expect to be said. And you can give a, up to three example phrases of things they could say once they've installed the skill as well. So you're never actually installing a skill blind you know from the entry on the app store that you what kind of thing you can say and you'd expect those to be the most popular things people are going to say so they should be the most optimized the most efficient and also the most useful to show what your skill can do okay. Okay. Uh, you said that um, with you don't actually get what people say back to your skill not the exact what, speech no. what does the json actually look like what, what, what do you get from it? Um, when you set up the intent so the phrases you're looking for you can say, these are all the different phrases that I've got, and then you put um, curly braces in to say, and then there is going to be a thing here. And you give that a data type, so that is number or city or a custom list that you add, that kind of thing. And then what you get back in your JSON is a set of slot. So you get a dictionary, um, key value pair on slot name, and the information. So um, you can also do it if it's a custom list. You can say, well, these are the words, but all these words mean this ID, and it will return back exactly which one of the words you've typed in it said, and the ID it matched to. So potentially, if you've got half a dozen different ways, certainly with things like meetups, where they're very custom phrases that Alexa might have issue picking up on, you put all the weird variations in. So Tech Nottingham was um, Toast Nottingham, 
um, that kind of thing. So you put the mistakes in as well to try and make it easier to pick up. And then go, but all of these are techno. Or all of these are leech All the hard work with, for example, the weather, I could say, what's the weather like in Leeds? Or I'm in Leeds, what, what's the weather like? Or something like that. And, and it will just recognize it and just, just give you the Those location. are two distinct phrases the natural language processing would want to know about. It will get rid of short words. It will understand with some of it like yes and no. It will, it has a vast dictionary of alternatives. But yeah, what's the weather like in Leeds is one intent. <coughs> in Leeds what's the weather is a different intent so you put all the different options in it then builds a machine learning model that says all these phrases are things I'm caring about they're all valid mm -hmm. and then it picks out the bits specifically so Leeds would probably be the option because yeah. potentially you've got different towns different cities and then what you get back in the skill is just yeah location was that mm -hmm. is it quite Initially, yes, and they have just released functionality that you don't have to go through the full certification process to update the intent, as long as the intents are still considered uh, a similar kind of phrase. You can add to an existing intent and build that up without full certification. It was exceptionally time consuming when you went, damn, that first phrase that that person just said is what I should have been thinking of, and then you have to go through a full certification process again. Yes, yeah, so that what you use the fallback for then. Fallback it's helps with that, certainly, yeah. I cannot recommend enough beta testing. Your friend, your colleague, your family will always say the thing you didn't think of, and they will always say it first. <laughs> <laughs> always. I, I love my family to death, but there have been times. <laughs> because I've gone, yeah, no, it's great. It does all this wonderful stuff. And they've said the wrong phrase and gone, your skill just doesn't work. I tried <laughs> three or four different ways, and it never did what I asked it to do. I just stopped using it. And it's just... But yeah, at that point, it's like, show me how you use the thing. And the beta is a really important part of that because it sends out an email, it still installs it, but installs it as a beta and you have a time limit on it. So I think it's 30 days by default and they get 30 days use so they can mess around with it, not like it, like it, whatever. And you get real feedback from that, which is ridiculously useful exactly for that reason. But it's also a good reason to make sure that you are having random conversations. You don't need an Alexa device to figure out how the conversation goes post-it notes and a friend going, right, okay, I'm gonna to pretend to be Alexa, and it might sound silly, but the number of times that it has just been, why would you say that? <laughs> like, really? I've just said this, and you're saying that? You expect the Alexa to understand that, and it's like, yeah, okay, fine. Well, <laughs> we'll put it down, add it to the list just in case, and then find out it was really useful. So yeah, beta test, and then do a lot of offline testing with conversation. Conversational design is something you learn. It's not something, despite the fact we all have them, we don't pay attention to them and building them in an automated way is really difficult. But once you get it, you get it. And it's really, really interesting. Um, how does it do, just building on the Matt's weather example, yep. when you ask Alexa, say, uh, Alexa, what's the weather tomorrow? Yep. How does it do the geolocation? What sort of information do you get as to where I am? You know, so if you need it, you know, yep. it device location is, um, is part of the information you can get back. I'm trying to remember if device location roughly, I think. I think you get, um, you can ask for device location, it will give you a rough area. So I think it's like the first half of the postcode kind of area. Okay. So if you want full address, then you ask for it and then you could start doing some more pinpointy work. Is that sort of based off the, like, the delivery addresses in the Amazon account of the user? Or when, you, yeah, either when you sign up for the, um, when you sign up for the device, there is a registered address that's okay. for the device. So yeah, if you have an account, if you had a device assigned to you and then shipped it to a family member and they used it, that's gonna cause you some problems. Uh, yeah, so, but yeah, definitely. And it's one of those things where potentially you might wanna look at the information you're getting compared to the information you thought you were looking for and then go, doesn't look like you're near the house kind of thing. So you so, never get the location of the device? That's you don't get the specific location, no, because um, you get, there is an API that they have announced that will allow for specific latitude, longitude location from an API. But I've only ever looked at that in the hypothetical, so I don't know how that would work with a device. Because obviously you're on a Wi-Fi connection with a router and then a provider, so I don't know. Although you can oh, put that in, oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly, that so kind of thing. So useful if you've lost, you know, Alexa. Where the hell are you? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and yeah, and a specific location is something you can turn on as an option, but I don't know how that would work with the device that's sat in a thing. But yeah, with 
Alexa Auto having just come out in the US and soon to be out in the UK where you can put it in your car, that kind of example is something people would switch off. So yeah, definitely you're going to start seeing examples where actually near me is another one where you're going to want to start looking at that kind of functionality. And yeah, um, you can ask for it. How do you maintain state between requests? Um, by default, there's a couple of ways. So there is a session object that you use with Alexa.net and part of that is an attributes dictionary, which is the key value store and then it will just send, um, you send them out with the response, you get them back in the request. You can write um, what are called interceptors with the request handler package to go, um, so if you want functionality to happen on everything regardless, one of the things that um, I use that quite often for is whatever attributes I've added in the in during this whole conversation, just send them back as the response. You also get a session ID, um, so that's good for that particular conversation. And therefore, if you want to store it for um, the length of a session, you can store it in persistent storage and use the session ID as the identifier. If you want more permanent storage, and this is quite an important one, um, you do get the user ID and that's okay. User ID is not unique to the user, it's unique to that installation. So if the user uninstalls your skill and then reinstalls it, they'll get a new user ID. So you won't track between installations. Um, so what they recommend is if you want to do genuine user tracking of state, then you can um, do account linking on an Alexa skill, which is any OAuth 2 setup, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you want, any social media stuff, mm -hmm. that kind of setup, or your own if it's an account that um, they've already signed up for, and you can ask the user to link their account through OAuth 2. You will then get, as well as the API access, you'll get an OAuth token back from whatever API provider that's been set up with. So yes, you can link accounts directly if you want it over multiple users or multiple um, multiple installations. But yes, there's a couple of ways of doing it. But you've got to realize that obviously um, sending it as part of the request and response stuff, that there is a size attached to that. So yeah, it's great if it's small little bits of data. This is the third time they've asked. Maybe you should try and offer them a hint, that kind of thing. But anything more than that, you want to be looking at tracking through one of the IDs or, or account linking. Yeah. Thank Thanks, Steve. Um, we're going to be um, going to brew tap. Drinks are on afterwards. So, drinks are on our lovely sponsor, Fruition. That's right, yes, yes, yes. <laughs>